Luno, the fastest, easiest way to buy Bitcoin. If you're just getting into crypto, it's the perfect place to start. Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of the Leia Heil Plan Show. So today is going to be a lot of fun. But before I introduce my guests, um, this particular episode is sponsored by Coin Corner, the UK and Europe focused Bitcoin exchange that offers very lucrative Bitcoin cashback when you shop online. It's even up to 40% with some partners and they have over a thousand different partners and merchants. So pretty cool. All you have to do is just add the browser extension um, and then you can get cashback when you shop online in Bitcoin, which I think is great. So I'm going to leave um, a link for you guys somewhere um, in the description. Um, and there you go. Just, just go for it. All right, guys. So today, before I introduce my guest, please don't forget if you are watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button so you never miss any of these interviews. So joining me today is the host of CNBC's Crypto Trader and the host of your beloved YouTube channel. It is Ran Nuna of Crypto Banter. Nearly stumbled on it there. How are you doing, Ran? Hi, Leia. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Fantastic, fantastic. Another great day. Another another quiet day in crypto with this Litecoin news, Litecoin Walmart news. I mean, just when I thought I had my show all cut out, one minute before <laughs> my show, the news breaks, it's garbage. So had to put it all together, but we're good. Well, since you bring that up, let's just talk about it because it literally just happened. Litecoin did, in fact, spike 20% and then it dropped. What do you think happened? Was this somebody trying to do a quick pump and dump or was this a genuine kind of mistake i think it's much more malicious than we think because okay. i think what they showed now is how easy the entire crypto market is manipulated and if you kind of think about the substance in the news and to be honest when i first heard the news i warned the guys at the office i said look this doesn't sound right because if walmart it, it would be very logical for walmart to adopt crypto that's like obvious yeah but it would be crazy for them to adopt litecoin and i don't mean that with any disrespect to the litecoin community but what you would do is you would adopt a basket of cryptocurrencies because the switches are all exactly the same and you'd say we have you know we, we're starting to accept crypto and you'd accept bitcoin as the most accepted crypto in the world you'd accept bitcoin on some kind of lightning channel or, or something like that so i mean we, it was suspect but when cnbc confirmed it and reuters confirmed it and I mean, I looked at this and I thought, hold on, it's, C it's not like it's, it's CNBC, it's Reuters, it's got to be news. So I laid out the whole show. Now we changed the whole show to be a Litecoin focused show. And then as the show went live, we started seeing it may be fake news. So we had to go back to the, to some kind of mix of a, between the original show and the Litecoin show. But you know, what's so weird. People are now calling for more crypto regulation just because of this. But, what what, I, I, but I'd be interested to see, so go on, run, go on, run. That's what it was about. It was about yeah. showing how easy it is to manipulate the crypto market. So people like Gary Gensler uh, yeah. are looking at this and going, you know, they, they've got now another bullet in the arsenal to say to us, hey, guys, you know, you want a Bitcoin ETF and you want a Litecoin ETF. But look how easily manipulated the crypto market is where one news story can drive the price up 10 percent in, in a matter of 15 minutes. And then five minutes later, all the retail hands get get dumped uh, and get stopped out. And that's exactly what happened. In fact, I was looking at the liquidation stats on Litecoin. Oh, and man. I mean, the numbers are crazy. The, like the number of people that got stopped out and liquidated on Litecoin was insane. What Do you have the numbers? Though, uh, yeah, I can quickly call them up for you. Uh, what it shows, though, is a system, which we've covered before on our show, um, a system of how to manipulate crypto. So what you do is you go to a, a, a good sounding. So let's look at the, the quickly. Let's quickly look at the one hour numbers. Um, okay, so those are the one hour numbers. So you can see that this read them is out, read them so out because people will be about, listening on audio. About a million dollars uh, worth of Litecoin got stopped. But when I was looking at it, I was looking at the, the number of accounts. So it's all small retail hands accounts that got stopped out. And that's in the last, uh, sorry, that's the last hour. Hold on, let me take you back four hours because that would, so 25 million got stopped on Litecoin. Um, 143,000. 143,000 Litecoin. So this is the people that were stopped. The number, the, the clue is actually in the number here where you see that there's 151,000 Litecoin that were actually stopped, 151,000 accounts that were actually liquidated and, and the vast majority of those were Litecoin oh accounts. Oh my God, that's so insane. So it's just showing how easy it is to manipulate the crypto market and that's the sad thing. 
That is unbelievable. I mean, what would be more interesting for me would be to see some actual journalism and some fact checking. Because well, when you've got people like like Reuters and CNBC confirming this, I mean, Reuters and CNBC, that was my telltale sign that this thing might actually be real. Um, you kind of believe something. But the formula is simple. You go to a newswire that sounds credible. And in, in this one, it was called Global Newswire. It sounds well, I think credible. it was Globe. I think it was Globe, globe. Newswire as opposed so to Global. Sounds, it sounds all credible. Yeah. And then all the other, all the news outlets pick it up because they want to be the first and they kind of FOMO into breaking the news and they do absolutely no research. And then by that time, this fake news has actually become real news. You know, by that time, it, the fake news actually is real news. And yeah, I mean, the, then the crypto markets have been manipulated and it's the poor retail investor that gets stopped out. So with a very small amount of money, you can yeah. destroy and wreck retail investors. That's insane. So when you say, um, you know, these are people trying to prove a point about how volatile and immature this market is, you genuinely think that this is for, this came from a malicious place. This came from yeah. perhaps people trying to prove a point that it does indeed need to be regulated. Correct. That That's or awful. people that wanted to get out of a Litecoin position, which doesn't really yes. make sense. And if you watch the, the markets, Bitcoin went up and like, so Litecoin went up first and then Bitcoin went up. So, I mean, crazy. There you go. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's sad. It's, sad. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a bad day for crypto. It's a bad day for crypto. It's a sad day for crypto. Because we're we going to get... Sorry, go on, Ron. <laughs> we want the markets to be filled with integrity. And we want the markets to be sophisticated markets and good markets. And when this happens, it just, you know, all the hard work that we do to bring credibility to these markets gets killed. And it's sad. It's, it's, as someone in crypto, it's sad that, we, that there's so much manipulation. Uh, I know there's manipulation in every market in the world, in gold, in, in oil, in, in everything else. But, you know, crypto, because the, the market caps are so small, is so easy to manipulate. And specifically, when you manipulate crypto, you manipulate against the retail investor. So, you know, the, the retail investor is the one that gets hurt. Arguably, when stock markets are manipulated, it's hedge funds manipulating and, and liquidating other hedge funds. Here, it's the retail investor that's getting blown out the water by fake news. So what's the solution to this? Are you pro-regulation then? I am pro-regulation. Um, I think, I think if, you, if you think that crypto is going to remain unregulated, and I mean, let's just rewind. What do we mean by crypto remaining unregulated? Mm -hmm. The fastest way to transfer assets around the world at the lowest possible commission with no bureaucracy whatsoever if you think that that industry is not going to get regulated, you're living in a dream. Like it's, it's, it's not, not an option. It's going to be highly regulated. Now, I'm all for regulation, but I think it's got to be logical regulation. It's got to be regulation for the right reason. The type of regulation that we saw with the infrastructure bill, garbage. You know, um, uneducated, uninformed politicians lobbying for points, inserting... Um, unthought through regulation into another bill, that's not regulation. But I do think we need regulation because that will bring more money into crypto and ultimately it will protect the retail investor. So I want to learn more about you, Ran. Um, I don't know loads. Um, and I want to go back a little bit before crypto, before, before those days. Um, you're obviously um, based in South Africa. Um, you, you've done a lot. You're, um, you know, you do work with CNBC. But I really want to understand what you did um, before crypto. You know, in your twenties, in your thirties, what was life before crypto? I'll take you on a little journey. So, in my twenties, I've, I've I've always been a crazy entrepreneur. Uh, built and sold many companies. Um, in nineteen ninety eight, I raised a lot of money from a lot of people to start an online stockbroking stock broking portal. Um, I raised a lot of money. I was, I was set to become one of the youngest internet company directors on the stock exchange here. Um, we were building in the internet bubble. And in 2000, when the bubble popped, so did our company and so did Run. So Run became, Run was broke. Broke to the extent that I had to go back and live with my parents. Uh, broke to the extent that I had to mortgage my car, broke to the extent that I couldn't afford to go out to restaurants because I didn't have money and I couldn't be bumming with my dad anymore. It was, like, it was embarrassing. How many times can you take $20 from your dad? It's, it's embarrassing. Um, so I was down and out. 
So I threw myself a probably a three month pity party. And <laughs> I didn't do much. I had a pity party. And then I started looking for things to do. And I had a girlfriend who was doing what we call in-store promotions. That's, you know, when people do, you know, alcohol promotions or toothpaste promotions in, inside the supermarkets. And I went to visit her in a store one day and a few things happened. The first thing is she wasn't there, which showed me oh, that dear. they were monitored. The second thing is I saw 60 other people doing in-store promotions. Um, and yeah. they were untrained and they were terrible salespeople. And I thought, hold on, I could do this better. And I started a marketing agency and it became the biggest marketing and sales agency in Africa. Fast forward 15 years, I sold that to a company called Publicis in the biggest media and marketing transaction on the African continent. Promised myself I was going to retire, found Bitcoin, went down the rabbit hole, and that began my crypto life. So I started investing in, in many crypto companies and in Bitcoin. Wait, 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 wait. But how, how did you find Bitcoin? How did you, how did you discover crypto? Um... So it came to me from a couple of places, but in late 2014, early 2015, a friend of mine said, I'm buying, and he's always been like, you know, every group's got like the early adopter friend, like that one mm -hmm. friend was a gamer and he's always, uh, and he came to me and said, I'm buying this magic internet money and it just keeps video, magic internet video game money. It's called Bitcoin and it just keeps going up in value. And, you know, I'm a DJ and gambler. So I was like, okay, well, if it keeps going up in value, buy me $10,000 worth of this stuff. And then I bought $10,000 and it doubled. And I was like, hold on, this is the easiest money I've ever made. Buy me another $50,000. And I just What year was this? This is end of 14, beginning of 15, December 14. Okay. This is when this all started. And I started buying Bitcoin. Um, just not knowing, I had no idea what this was other than the party line, which was, this is magic internet money. Yeah. Um, and that began... Then I was starting, then I started to hold a stash of Bitcoin. You know, when number go up, you start realizing, you, you start reading about what you actually bought. I must admit, <laughs> when I first read about it, I was like, why do you need decentralized money? Who, like, what's wrong with government money? Which I think is a big point. I think the ordinary man in the street doesn't really understand the need for non government money. Like, nine out of 10 people can't see why the government is, 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 um, is detrimental to money management. Like no one sees this or specifically at the time in 2014 and 15, we didn't have this money printing through COVID. Uh, I think maybe now people are starting to wake up, but we've got to remember that nine out of 10 people still don't understand the need or the concept of non-government controlled money. It's a complicated concept because there's no reason why the government shouldn't control money to most people. It's only the few people you know, the one out of 10, which is us in the crypto community that have started to educate ourselves as to why the value of money has been dropping and, you know, what, and what the Fed has been doing. And yeah, so that was 2014, 2015. In 2016, 20, sorry, in 2017, uh, I went to CNBC and I said, look, you know, you got to be covering this asset class. It's called Bitcoin. Yeah. And we're like, Bitcoin, you're yeah, right. It's scam money. It's a Ponzi scheme. It's, I mean, I heard all, I heard all the, the, buzz lines. And then eventually I met a friend of mine who's one of the directors. I met him about something else and I educated him about Bitcoin. And I think the penny dropped for him. And yeah. he said, look, go and speak to my head of production. So I went to the head of production. I spoke to the head of production. And you know, when you teach people about Bitcoin and there's that like one second where you see their eyes light up and the penny drops. Yeah. So I was like, I saw that look in her eyes. I saw like, I, I saw she got it. Like I gave myself a pat on the back and I said, oh, I obviously did a great job teaching her about it. And so I said to him, look, guys, you got to be covering this asset class. And she says, yeah, we do. We need to have, and all I wanted them to do was actually to cover it on Power Lunch or Squawk Box or whatever, just like for three minutes. And she said, this thing needs to have a weekly show. It can't be three minutes. It needs to be 26 minutes and it needs to be live. So I was like, great. Good, good luck with that. If you need me, call me. And she said, what do you mean? She said, you're doing the show. And I was like, hold on a second. Weekly? <laughs> Big commitment. Yeah. Remember, I just sold my company, so I kind of had the time. 26 minutes? That's a shitload of content in 2017. And live, I'd never done TV before in my life, and you want me to sit there live. And she said, look, you'll have a production team, and we'll teach you how to do TV. So I arrived back there the next week, 
and I've got a production team, but I realized the production team doesn't know much about Bitcoin. So like they gave me stuff to look at. I was like, no, you can't say that. That's not Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. No one understood it. So I said, hold on, I got this. And I phoned a whole lot of my friends in crypto. I phoned Brock Pierce, Spencer Bogart. And I said, listen, next week, Wednesday, 10 o'clock in the morning or whatever the time was, I'm going to send you a Zoom link. And then you're going to be live on the first televised crypto show in the world on CNBC. And that's how we ran the show. And I look back at my first shows. I was terrible. I'm, I'm still terrible. But I look back at the first shows. I was really terrible. Uh, I was re- you could see me reading off the prompter like this. But I mean, I got through it and I got better and better. And now we are where we are, where we are today. That's such a fascinating story. It's so interesting, you know, that this happened all the way back in 2017, because even then, I think that is so early. I think, you know, even now we have, we struggle so hard to get mainstream news outlets to even talk respectively um, in a respectful way about Bitcoin, as we've seen, you know, with the El Salvador and and all that news coverage that that got. Um, But right now you're doing an amazing job with Crypto Banter. Um, You have one of the most incredible communities, um, the most loyal community, everybody. It's like one big family. It's truly amazing. So I'd love to understand how you built that and, you know, how you're able to create something so powerful. Okay. So I realized a few things when I came out of CNBC. And so I ran the once a week show with CNBC and I realized a few things. One is once a week is not enough for a crypto show because the market moves way too quickly. Once an hour is maybe not even enough for a crypto show because the market moves absolutely too quickly. Yeah. The second thing is I realized that crypto people don't trust CNBC as a new source. Facts. They, it has credibility in other stuff, but they don't trust it in crypto. It, they used to call me the counter indicator. When I was at CNBC, they said, CNBC is the counter indicator. When CNBC says buy, you sell. The third thing that I realized was <laughs> crypto people don't relate to suits and ties. They don't want a guy in a suit and tie talking to them in a studio, sitting there with his posture, with his hands on the counter, and, and pretend. they want you to be who you are. Yeah. And that was the biggest lesson that I got. That if I'm authentic transparent, honest with my community, then they will trust us. And the more authentic we became and the more we realized that actually the whole reason why we're doing this is about community and we don't actually care. We've become absolutely selfless. We don't care about ourselves. We do not care about ourselves. We only care about the community. We we make sure we get allocations for our community. We do give away. We gave away like a million dollars in a week, two weeks ago, to the what? community. How? And what, How did you do that? We got offered allocations in IDOs. Right. We decided to, instead of taking the allocations first, to take them and to give them to our community. And mm-hmm. the allocations came onto the market at 50, 100, 200 X. And we just gave it to the community. And we said, and we did it at pre-IDO prices. So even though we knew what the price was, we knew it had done a 30X or a 40X, we still gave them $100 each in pre-IDOs. So what I realized was, and it's it's actually a big lesson in my life for me, it's just give, just give. You don't need any more. I don't need any more. Like I'm not not very wealthy on international levels, but I don't really need any more. And I get much more joy and passion giving to the community. And when you start to give selflessly, transparently, authentically, without expecting anything back, this, the biggest thing happened. This community just became loyal to us and they became like a family. And we saw this when my producer's father passed away. He passed away from COVID. And the community was like, we're like his biggest support structure. And then we brought a new member into the family who's a trader. His name is Sheldon. Sheldon was a carpenter who lost his father less than 12 months ago. He was broke. He had to sell his carpentry equipment, but he realized he had a gift for charting. And I discovered him and I said, you know, I just want to just change your life. And I brought him onto Banter and I said, Banter fam, meet Sheldon. And I told him the Sheldon story. That Sheldon story has been viewed over 300,000 times on YouTube. And they love him and he's part of the family. And we've got this like Banter fam family where the family explodes every day. All we do is give. All we do is give. We never, ever, ever, our motto is we never, ever, 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 ever take money from our community for anything. No money from any member of the community ever for anything. No subscriptions, no, no paywalls, nothing. We even, we have a school 
I pay teachers. We created a syllabus. The school is free. It's, we're going to put a million people through school by the end of 2022, and it is free. It's costing us money, but we're going to put a million people through crypto school in 20, by the end of 2022 for free. What does crypto so, school look like? It is 100 people per class, live classes. You get, you get put into groups of 10 in the class. Uh, there's three streams. The first stream is an introduction to crypto investing, and that is uh, starts off with a history of money, goes into uh, understanding centralization, understanding network effects, Bitcoin, Bitcoin versus gold, yeah. Ethereum, altcoins and Bitcoin disruption, uh, exchanges and wallets, security and scams, and then it ends off with building a crypto portfolio. And by the end of the first module, all we want you to do is to be able to have a conversation about any altcoin and be able to build a crypto portfolio. And if we've done that, then we've achieved our objective. That's stream number one. Once you've graduated from stream number one, you can be accepted into stream number two, and that is making a career out of crypto. So if you want to know how to stake, if you want to know how to analyze tokenomics, if you want to know how to chart, if you want, you know, there's so many different ways to make money out of crypto. So we are, we'll then take you into what we call sniper school. And that's like the second, so it's crypto school, then sniper school, where you can make the, the most accurate trades. And there we teach you trading, staking, psychology of investing, um, you know, different portfolio strategies, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And the third stream is a separate stream, which is crypto for institutions. And that is, uh, how do I reward my consumers with crypto? How do I accept crypto? Where do I store the crypto? Uh, what are the positives? What are the, the, the negatives? Uh, you know, where, where do I keep my crypto treasury? Stuff like that. So it's three streams. Uh, and our objective is a million people by the end of 2022 and all free. That's incredible. I love that so much. I find the information right now is that there's such a barrier to entry because the information is so difficult. And also there's just so much information. So people don't really know where to start. So having a place where people can go um, and just have everything organized into some kind of educational format, I think is great. It's amazing that it's free. Um, but I want to just tell you, I think I did tell you, um, but I want to let your, um, your audience know as well. Talking, speaking of how big the banter family is, a few months ago, I was just out having breakfast somewhere in London. And um, this guy just sitting next to me was just watching you on YouTube. Um, and he was like, do you know, do you know, do you know, uh, Rand, do you know, Crypto Banter? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I know them. Um, and then you, I think you used one of my videos on your show. And yeah, then the he doubled. Yeah. yeah. And then he doubled look, takes and looks at me twice. And he was like, that was you. And I was like, yeah, that was me. So it's such a small world. I can't believe just some little place in like the outskirts of London. I was just sitting for breakfast. You, and, won't, uh, believe, you won't believe how popular crypto is. And, it, and like I, when I go for a run in the mornings in, in New York or in Miami, I live in Miami. So when I go to New York or Miami and I'm running, people spot me. When I entered the US, the TSA official that actually checks you in, oh, that's he checks so funny. in and you, you try to keep a straight <laughs> See, he was like looking at me and like, and at the end of it, he said, so what do you think? Should I be buying Bitcoin or Litecoin right now? I'm like, how do you know? He's like, I watch you every single day. So it's like, think. like, there's just people everywhere that watch you. And again, I think it's because of our attitude where we just give, it's free. We don't want anything back from the community except maybe a like and a subscribe. Um, mm. And we're authentic. We disclose all our holdings. We tell people when we invest. Um, you know, we, don't, we have a lot of rules like, you can't sell any token if you've spoken about it on the show for, I don't, I don't remember the numbers, but it's like 48 hours. So we can never oh, pump wow. and dump on our community. So we're trying to build, I want to take on CNBC. Not take on, I want to run a parallel to CNBC. I want to have, you think about the traditional financial world. Mm -hmm. You can switch on CNBC or Bloomberg at any time of the day or night. And within 30 minutes, you've got, you know exactly what's happening on the markets from a live credible source. Mm -hmm. With crypto, that doesn't exist. With crypto, you have to go to Twitter and good luck finding credible information on Twitter. Then you have to go to Telegram and I don't know what your Telegram looks like, but if it's anything That's like nice. my Telegram, no chance. So there's no way to get it. There's not one button where you can go live, credible, 24-7, 365 streaming of crypto content. And that's the market that I want. Live, I not in for long form. I want to be live. If you want live information, that is credible, 24-7, 365, 
go to crypto banter. That's what we're building. We're going to take on CNBC. We're going to become the parallel in the crypto universe. And one day we're going to buy them. Damn. I love it. I think that's amazing. Um, but I want to delve into altcoins with you because you know a lot. Um, your followers say you know a lot. So I want to go into it. I have a lot of questions. So you said recently that you sold your Ethereum for Sol. Is that yes. correct? Yeah, I sold about 60% of my ETH and I put the money into Solana. And I put the money in between $25 and about $50. Actually, I bought some more at $80, so at about $80. Okay, so talk me through this. A lot of people say that Solana is the Ethereum killer. Why? Why does it have to be the Ethereum killer? And for it to be an Ethereum killer, they have to be direct competitors. And are they? Well, it depends how you see it. I think what we've realized... Let's talk about what Ethereum is. Let's understand okay. what is Ethereum. So for, to most people, Ethereum is a smart contract blockchain. That's yeah. how you see it. To me, Ethereum is a call option on multiple different e blockchain experiments, which may all disrupt the world. So if you think about the two that have succeeded out of the hundreds that have happened, one of them is DeFi and the second one is NFTs. Mm -hmm. And what we have realized with, the, with DeFi disruption and the NFT disruption is that if any other experiments are built, we're going to need a lot of blockchain capacity. Because yeah. if you've seen what NFTs have done to Ethereum, they've made Ethereum not usable. Arguably, NFTs are in the beginning, beginning, beginning of their life cycle. We haven't even seen 1% of the disruption that NFTs are going to do. And the biggest blockchain that we have by market cap can't handle the transactions to the extent that it is broken, useless, and unusable to the majority of people. Right? It's, 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 it's unusable. Yep. So with that thesis in mind, I'm not saying that they're going to be Ethereum killers, but I'm saying that they probably are going to need to be a whole lot of blockchains that are going to work. Then I worked, I worked down who are the blockchains and what chance they've got of success. So for a blockchain to succeed, you need great technology. You need a developer ecosystem, which has... Like, like the reason why Ethereum worked is because all developers believed in decentralization and that ethos. So you can't mm -hmm. have a centralized blockchain. And then you need money. You need VC money. Yeah. So I look at Solana. Solana has VC money in the form of Sam Bankman Fried, Multicoin Capital, and a whole lot of investors. It has incredible technology. It has the, the fastest technology that I know for smart contract blockchain finality. It is decentralized enough and it is scalable. So that's when I, when I realized that and I saw what was going on with NFTs, I thought, you know what? I know that I'm, I'm passionate about Ethereum, but I'm actually going to be a big boy and I'm going to say, you know what? I, I like it because I'm emotionally attached to it, but logically Solana has to work and Solana worked. And then I look at Cardano and I say, hold on. Uh, love Cardano. Great technology. Why? So love Cardano because if you understand the technology on Cardano, Cardano is very sophisticated technology that makes blockchain very simple. Okay, so Cardano is going to make blockchain very simple. And Cardano has a lot of money behind it. Um, it has a very, very, very loyal community. In fact, yes. only now we are seeing that the Solana community is staking more than the Cardano community. Yeah. And as of yesterday, Solana. Cardano has smart contracts. So now you've got two very viable options, but Solana has much more traction than Cardano. And so that's why I put a lot of money into Solana and a little bit into Cardano. And then I bought a little bit more of AVAX because I said, look, we need a lot of uh, uh, smart contract technology because none of the layers are going to be able to fill it up. And AVAX is the one that is up and coming. And so I put a small little bit on AVAX. So that's my thesis around smart contract blockchains. And I do believe that they will all succeed and there will be space for all of them. And I think that in the long, long, long term, Ethereum mm -hmm. is going to be the biggest underperformer. You think the thing which gets me about all these blockchains is they're all doing very similar things. And it's very difficult, I find, to really get to grips with, you know, the, the, the detailed intricacies which make them just slightly different. A lot of them are working on, you know, uh, interoperability. A lot of them are working on smart contracts, DeFi, NFTs, dApps, you know, the whole thing. Um, so when you look at something like Solana and, you, and a lot of people say it's, it's the Ethereum killer, how does that then, how does that then compare, for example, to Binance Smart Chain? Because a lot of people were saying back in April during the peak of the bull market that Binance Smart Chain is going to completely destroy Ethereum, even though it's kind of like a copy of it. 
so how, how, where does Binance Smart Chain come into it for you? Binance Smart Chain, Binance Smart Chain is, is a tricky one because if you look at the BNB token, it's a token for an exchange and it's also an exchange, a token for a smart chain. Yeah. So it has its, I mean, it has its pros and cons. On the one hand, if the, if the exchange fails, the smart chain will work. If the smart chain fails, the exchange may work. So you may have be, you know, uh, right. diversified. On the other hand, I don't know, have you ever used Binance Smart Chain? It's, it's a clunky experience. I use and, it just for like trading and if I'm on like PancakeSwap or something like that. <laughs> a clunky experience. It's because it's a fork of Ethereum. It's much, much, much more centralized than Ethereum and much more centralized yes. than Solana. Yeah. It's, it's very cheap. And at one stage, a lot of people are building on it. But if you want decentralization and you want to go from, I don't know, 20 or 30 validators or whatever the number of validators are on the Binance Smart Chain to 700 validators, which makes it a lot more decentralized, then you go to Solana. Mm -hmm. From a speed point of view, Solana has blockchain finalization in 0 0.4 of a second. And they do this through a piece of technology where they've embedded a clock, a watch, a clock, into mm -hmm. their technology. So, and the reason for that is most of the time, blockchain systems are working out what came first and what came second. They have to agree on what happened before what. What Solana okay. did was embed a clock and said, you know, if we've got a clock, then the clock tells us what came first and what came second. And so they don't have to argue about what came first and what came second, and they don't have to reach that level of consensus, which makes Solana the fastest blockchain out there. I don't know of any blockchain that settles transaction faster than Solana. But you, you said about, you think, say that again, sorry. No, I don't know any, any blockchain that settles fin, finality faster than Solana. But you said that you think Ethereum will come last in this race, which is yep. really interesting because obviously there's ETH 2.0 coming, proof of stake coming eventually. Yeah. Do you not think that's going to change things a bit? Do you not think Ethereum still has that first mover advantage so that when ETH <clears throat> 2.0 does come, you know, it, it might sort of kill the question. other competitors? Interesting question. So traditionally, I would have said to you that ETH cannot be disrupted. And okay. the reason why it cannot be disrupted is the same reason why Bitcoin can't be disrupted. And that is because it has network effects. So for people watching who don't know what network effects are, it's like, a, it's like WhatsApp. With every user that joins the network, you can make more calls in the network and therefore the network is worth more exponentially. So if Leia and I on, on WhatsApp, the maximum number of calls we can do is I can phone Leia and she can phone me. That's two calls. If we add a third person, then, you know, Fred, that I can phone Leia, Leia can phone me, I can phone Fred, Fred can phone me, Fred can phone Leia. And so we increase the number of calls that can be made on the network exponentially. Yes. Once something has network effect, the rule is that it cannot be stopped. And in fact, even the growth of it can't be stopped. So it's, you know, it's, it's the reason why investors are so happy to pay a premium for Facebook, for Amazon, for Google, because they all have network effect. So there are only three things that can stop a protocol that has network effect. In the world, government intervention is one. So if the government says, hey, Bitcoin is banned, Ethereum is banned, you're gonna stop the network effect. Mm -hmm. The second one is a, um, a breakdown in the technology. So I'm gonna park that one for a second. Okay. And the third one is a competitor which is 10X better, has a small potential to be able to steal market share from the incumbent. So traditionally, I would say that any protocol that has network effect can't be stopped. But in this case, I think Ethereum has been on two of the three axes actually may be stopped. One is the technology doesn't work. It's just not fit for purpose. Right. And it's not fit for purpose at a time where lots of VCs are allocating money to blockchain development because they're seeing just how promising blockchain development is. Yeah. So they are taking the money from Ethereum and they're putting the money onto Solana right now. Right now, we're seeing a huge shift of money from Ethereum to Solana. The second thing is that Solana may actually be 10 times better than the current ETH product. So great, you've promised us this ETH 2.0, but the problem is you're taking too long to get to market. And because you're taking too long to get to market, you're opening the door for disruption. And so it's very, very interesting that I think that in most cases, even if you have a slightly better technology, you cannot break the network effect. But in this case, you have a better technology and you have a technological failure. 
And therefore, I think that Ethereum is at, is at risk of being disrupted. And then you add on one more thing and you say, this blockchain disruption is so big that no layer one is going to be able to handle it on its own. Mm. And so there's space for more than one. And then you go back to who's got the best technology, the most vibrant community, the greatest ethos, and the most money coming in. And Solana, maybe Cardano. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's where the money's going. I sort of look at it as similar to social media platforms. Yes. So you could say, in some sense, when they were first built, people, the, the developers didn't necessarily know that Twitter was going to be built for journalists and let's just say intellectuals or whatever, you know, people that like want to have that kind of debate and that kind of conversation. I don't think they had that in mind as opposed to, you know, Facebook being built that way and Instagram being more picturesque. And I don't think they had that in mind. I think it's kind of how they evolved naturally based on what their algorithms could do and what their technology could do. And I sort of see it like that. And I think that they won't necessarily all survive, but I definitely think more than one will survive. I think it's just arrogant in my opinion and ignorant to think mm -hmm. that only one blockchain will survive. Um, I think and I'm 10, talking across the mark. Like, I think 10 blockchains will survive, maybe even more. Bitcoin yes. is going to survive and it's going to be the, store, the ultimate store of value. It's yes. got network effects. The technology is great. It's proven. It's been battle tested a million times. It's amazingly decentralized. So Bitcoin, Bitcoin is safe. Yeah. Okay. Then we move on to smart contract blockchains. Ethereum, very decentralized. ETH 2.0 will be amazing when it launches. Um, but it's still not fast. It's still not 0.4 of a second to finality. Now, that's okay for large-scale DeFi transactions, institutional DeFi transactions, where you're more worried about decentralization and security than you are about speed. Mm. Okay, so then yeah. Ethereum will be a great blockchain for that. What about the mm -hmm. traders who need split-second speed? Solana. What about, the, the, what about video gamers who need split-second speed because that's the game? Solana. So different blockchains will do different things. And I think the nuances are going to become, you know, Cardano and Ethereum are going to be a little bit more centralized than, uh, decentralized than Solana. So people who really need decentralization as the, as the key access, security and decentralization will go to the Ethereum guys and the others will go to Solana. The other thing that we're not talking about here, but we should talk about is bridges. Mm, yeah. So right now, token bridges are clunky. Like it's clunky. It's a, it's a, yeah, it is. it's a terrible experience. It's like bridging a token from one place that it gives you anxiety. You've got to take two Xanax before you bridge them. And then you hope the tokens come out on the other side and that you haven't inputted something incorrectly. And I mean, it's a, <laughs> yes, even yeah, just was, sending a transaction. No, like even just still sending transactions still gives me anxiety. Cause I'm like, <sighs> is, is it a correct, did the copy paste work? Is it going to go to the correct address? It's not wrapped. It's the actual legit coin. It still gets me really, honestly. The polygon, somatic polygon bridge to get yeah. tokens from Ethereum to Polygon is quite quick. But when you send the tokens back from Polygon to Ethereum, it, like because of the, the Ethereum system, it could take like hours, many hours. So if you're sending reasonable amounts of money and <laughs> you have to wait hours, I mean, I just sit there and I'm like, when is this money going to arrive? When is this money going to arrive? When is this money going to arrive? So right now, bridges are clunky. They're mm -hmm. not user-friendly. They're getting better, but they're not user-friendly. And there's a lot of fees associated. Like you've got to wrap the token, one transaction, and you've got to send the, the token over the network, another transaction. But that is going to become almost seamless. In time, that is going to become almost seamless. So I mm -hmm. think there is a massive play on bridge technology. And there are good bridges out there, but people are discounting how important the bridges are from hopping from one network to another network to another network to another network. And one day, I think all these bridges will just be interconnected. Um, yes, I think so. Yeah. Speaking of which, interconnected, we don't talk about Polkadot and Kusama, which are just this... I was going to get to. Go on. ...between all these specialist blockchains. And that, for me, I was sitting this weekend and I was thinking, you know, this blockchain disruption is so big and no layer one can handle the transactions. So who's going to win? And I just thought to myself, who is the most scalable blockchain of all of them? And I thought, what's well, going to be Kusama or Polkadot? Because what they do is they connect a whole lot of specialist blockchains. So they connect like, yeah. like Moon River is the Ethereum, 
equivalent, which is it's it's a it's a it's Ethereum but plugged into Kusama. And just think about Ethereum one, Ethereum two, and Ethereum three, and then a special DeFi chain and then an AI chain, all plugged into one bridge. So you got a hundred chains, and they're all plugged into one bridge, and they transact seamlessly on what they call the substrate network, which is the Kusama yeah. network. And to me, I just that's when I realized just how big and how scalable the Kusama network and the Polkadot network will actually become. So, I mean, no one's talking about these yet, but I think that those two are also like the two horses that are in the race. You know, it's like a horse race and they're like, we're like in the beginning of the race and they're all in the pack. Mm. But no one's like looking and going, hold on, that's the horse that's going to break out at the end and going to give it like a, a big run at the end. And I think that's what's going to happen. I totally agree with you. I'm looking into all those projects that you mentioned right now, Kasama, Substrate, uh, Polkadot. I'm looking into all of them, investing probably more than I should. Um, but whatever, my money's going to lose value anyway if I don't invest it. So that's kind of my mentality. Um, but you kind of did just mention it. You know, you spoke about scalability, decentralization. Um, but what are the main kind of, um, I guess, trends and indicators that you look for um, when you're wanting to find something new to invest in follow the smart money what does that mean though that's like a cute catchphrase but like what does it mean I'm follow what, so what i've realized is if i look at avex avalanche and i yeah. look at our weave which is in my mind one of the one of the you know the best blockchain protocols out there um what i realized is that the smartest money in the world and the smartest mm -hmm. money in the world are people like andreessen horowitz polychain capital pantera multicoin capital these are people that have a lot of resources. They spend a lot of time researching things. They have a lot of money. They see a broad view of the industry yeah. and they decide to put big bets on these things. As a retail investor, that's your cue to be jumping in. That's when I say follow the smart money. You know, I, I mean, I get a taste of it because, because we're in the, in the media we see a broad range of projects. And because I have an, 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 an analytics team, an analyst team who research projects for me, I get a taste of what it must be like sitting at Andreessen, who've also got a lot more money and a lot more access uh, and a lot more research than I've got. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's an amazing place to be. So for me, the, the, the tr follow the smart money. Just Follow what the big funds are doing. Try and get if I if I could do one thing all day long, just understand where the big funds are allocating their money and understand it as quickly as possible. Because you know everyone's talking about Avalanche. Uh, Andreessen has funded Avalanche for three rounds. The last of round, if I'm not mistaken, was last year, 2020, when no one right. even spoke about Avalanche. No. You know. Um, but if you did your research, you'd know that he was funding it. And yes, he was it, was, well, it, was, it was pretty simple. It was, I'm going to just try and find it for us, but um, uh, Avalanche. I'm going to share your screen again. Let me just find it. Andreessen. Andre. No, <laughs> you got the, the Solana price up there. I like it. Solana price up. Let's, uh, so, uh, let's have a look here. Yeah, so uh, here we go. I mean, this is June. 2020 june 25th 2020 um base layer awards heat up with another 12 million committed to ava labs avalanche blockchain avalanche mm. and and it was led by galaxy by uh, andreessen by a whole lot of mm. others so you, you look at this and you go hold on what did they know a year ago that we're only finding out now mm. that's, I'm, I'm with you yeah so that's follow the, the smart money follow the smart money because you'll never so, have the resources to do to catch up with their resources. So just follow what they're doing. So what projects are standing out to you right now? <clears throat> Other than Solana. <laughs> um, so layer one blockchains. So Cardano, Solana, Avalanche, layer one, because I don't think we have enough layer ones. Luna, uh, the Terra Luna uh, ecosystem, because of the adoption because of the genius of how their stable coin works. If you understand what Terra, Terra Luna does, so uh, some people call it Luna, some people call it Terra. There's a, a stable coin that they create, which is called Terra no, yeah. no, or Luna. I don't know what, which one is a stable coin. Uh, it's, the Terra is a stable coin. I think the Terra and, is, yeah, I was going to say the Terra is a stable coin. The Terra is a stable coin. And they create applications which create use case for more Terra. And the more applications that they create, the more Terra need to be created to meet the demand of consumers, right? 
So the more consumers you get, the more terror you have to create. In order to create terror, you have to burn Luna, which increases the supply of terror. So you're watching this, this ecosystem where they are creating more and more and more amazing applications that are going to create more and more and more users into the Terra ecosystem and require a whole lot more Terra. To do that, they're going to have to burn and reduce the supply of Luna. So it's a no-brainer because they've just started and they've got like a market cap of $4 billion, I mean, or whatever the number is. I haven't looked at it today, but no-brainer. Yeah. I've been saying it since $0.35. Cents. Now at $35, people are starting to listen. Um, that, for me, is a great ecosystem. Another great ecosystem for me. The best. I've been calling it again since seven cents and ten cents and thirty-five cents. Arweave. Mm-hmm. Arweave is the most genius fucking thing in the world. <laughs> awesome. So I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on your podcast. Um, yeah, you can. It's chill. Go on. Okay, so it's it's when you understand how genius Arweave is. So you talk about file storage. Yeah. File storage is a flawed industry. So for one, every file storage provider in the world charges you per meg, per month, per gig, per month, per terabit, per month, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, and the information is not stored forever. And I know this because there were articles written about me less than 10 years ago, which I look for on the internet and they don't exist. And that is because... It's probably a just, good thing. <laughs> well, yeah, some of them are great, some, especially some of those photos. Um, <laughs> so what Arweave does is they are a blockchain, so to speak, and what they do is they store data forever with one payment. So instead of paying every month, you pay, I don't know what the number is, but call it $10 per X, and then it is stored forever. How? How? They have an endowment, and what they do is they, they, they charge you, and they've worked out what they think the, the cost of storing data is going to be, and they've added like multiples in it, but remember, the, the cost of storing data constantly gets reduced because computing power gets cheaper, storage space gets cheaper. Okay. And they've done the calculation and they take the money and they have a very sophisticated consensus algorithm which says to the block manufacturers, now the block manufacturers in this case have to store data. And they say, look, if you store the data you need to store plus some other random data which which it asks you for and if you've got mm-hmm. that you get the payment so you're incentivized to store as much data as possible and through that mathematically they can guarantee you that your data is actually going to be stored forever and so if you think about other blockchains or other storage protocols either google controls them or amazon controls them or they may not be around forever and then you say hold on if i'm buying an nft i'm buying a punk and mm-hmm. my punk cost me a couple of million dollars and I want to hand it down from generation to generation to generation. I want it to last forever. Yeah. If I'm publishing a, a world-changing, life-changing journalistic story. I want it to be there forever and not to be able to be deleted. And I want it to be there for another thousand. You know, when, when they're brushing off our news like, like we do with the pyramids and the pharaohs, I want, it to be, I want it to be there forever. And there's actually yeah, only that. one system or protocol in the world that does that, and that's our weave. So anything that is super important to you should be stored on Arweave. And there's no competitor. It's not like, oh, there's another one. No one else does it. It's What's only- the technology? It's like, what is that? Like proof of stake? Like, what is that? It's, they have their own consensus algorithm. It, they've got a, it, you ba- it's a consensus algorithm where you have to prove that you've got, that you've stored X plus some other random stuff. And right. I, I don't remember what, how they, 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 what they call it, but that means that everybody that stores data stores it forever. Yeah. And, and again, are we, people just haven't realized the power of Arweave, except now with NFTs, where people are storing NFTs there because they're being stored forever. Another one is Solana realizes that they've got to store their data somewhere. Where do they store the data? On Arweave. Oh, really? Where do you store blockchain data? The only place to store blockchain data forever is on Arweave. And so Solana is storing their mm-hmm. data on Arweave. And I think many more blockchains will follow. So for me, Arweave, no brainer. I mean, come on, you're going to be done buying Arweave. I don't know. I, I need to look this up now. I need to, I need to do some uh, DYOR, do your own research. Yeah. So yeah, for me, Luna, Solana, Arweave, um, Cardano, uh, the Layer 1s. And then 
I mean, you've got to have a speculative portfolio. I think everybody must have a speculative portfolio um, where you can have some fun. Um, well, get some well, on that point, I did ask people earlier um, what their questions were for you. And I had a one fun one, which I thought I have to ask, um, which kind of fits perfectly right now. Somebody said, if Ran had to put his entire life savings on one coin he thinks will 10x by Christmas, which uh, one would he choose? My entire life savings... On yeah. one coin that will 10x by Christmas. Wow. Hold on. Let me let me look at the portfolio. <laughs> oh damn. Coin that, but I wouldn't put my entire life savings on any coin. I think that's just negligent. I think that would dot, be, okay. I think dot hasn't run yet. I think dot hasn't run yet, which is which is uh, risky. I mean which is which is good. Wow, life savings, one coin. Probably somewhere on the Dot and Kusama ecosystem. I think that's good. Are we have Luna? Yeah, the rest are the risky. I'm scared to put people into very risky coins because. You, you, no, you don't have to. No, it's not financial advice. It's just it's just what you would do. You tell them to put one percent their portfolio and they put ninety percent because they think that's the coin and then they get themselves wiped out. Yeah, you got to be careful with that. Um, another question that came through was, um, what price? Um, Hang on, let me let me actually read it word for word because it's written kind of weirdly. Um, what price did he pay for his first BTC and his first ETH? First BTC, somewhere around five hundred dollars. Don't remember exactly, but somewhere around five hundred dollars. Uh, my first ETH, uh, it's between six and nine dollars, I think. I missed the idea. I bought between six and nine dollars. Damn. Um, okay, somebody's actually, I'm looking through the, the um, live chat now. Um, I wasn't looking earlier, but I'm looking now. Um, and people are asking about Link, and I can't believe I've not brought that up. I'd actually love to hear your opinion on Link. Link is amazing um, as an Oracle solution. It's got network effects as an Oracle solution. Um, yeah. But it's not as, I mean, I have Link in my portfolio, but it's not as exciting as, uh, it's really not as exciting as some of the biggest coins, you know, some of the most exciting coins. It's got to be a fundamental part of every portfolio, but it's not like it's not one of the coins that I think is going to change my life or triple before Christmas or, you know, I can't see them taking over the world. So, I mean, I'm in it, but I wouldn't be putting my life savings into it. No way. Okay. And then another question that I have, which is quite a funny one as well, is um, how many times have you been rug pulled? Oh, uh, yeah, many, many, many. Really? I mean, I, I sent. Is you're going to laugh. I think I sent, don't quote me the numbers, but I think I sent like a hundred, no, like 200 Bitcoin to a fake Bitcoin mining scam in 2016. Oh, Zali, I'll give you that. Yeah. I mean, they, they gave you a guarantee that they were doubling, they would double your Bitcoin and that my friends were all drawing their Bitcoin and I jumped into the Ponzi and I, I can't remember the number. I think I gave them 200 Bitcoin, which at the time was like $200,000. And then, it took two hundred. They took my two hundred thousand dollars. The next day, they shut down the website. So I've been ragged. So crazy. I've been ragged in DeFi. I was involved in some of these hacks in where where I had tokens in liquidity pools or in pools where they were hacked. But I mean, that's part of why we make the hundred extra returns because we're willing to take more risk. And every now and then, things are going to go wrong, and we just have to be. We have to we put on our big boy pants. So. I some more questions are coming through. I'm just gonna I'm gonna take two more, um, and then and then we'll and then we'll leave it. Um, somebody's asking, did they miss the boat on Seoul? I imagine I know your answer to this, but go on. I mean, if you're talking to me about the next week or two weeks, I can't answer that. But in the long term, yeah. I don't think we haven't even started yet. I think if you're gonna hold it for three, four, five years, you know, I bought Solana on my show live on the show for forty two dollars. Everyone told me I was crazy, um, mm -hmm. and then. It went back to $22 and people started to hate me on Twitter. And they said, oh, you bought, you know, $42 and we all bought after you at $42. No one's crying now. No yeah. one's, you know, no one's crying anymore. It depends how long your investment horizon is. Um, I tweeted the other day, I said, you know, people are talking about whether smart contracts will be a buy the rumor, sell the news on Cardano. Oh, who yeah, the, that was me. So yeah, I tweeted that. <laughs> Who the fuck is? Like, Corona is not about today or tomorrow or next week or next <laughs> yeah. month. I mean, even if smart contracts didn't work, they would fix it and next week it would work. You know, like, who cares? You're not buying blockchain technology for today. You're buying it for the next five years of disruption. And so, like, you think you've missed the boat on Solana now? <laughs> Come back in five years. Then, you, then you'll see what, what missing the boat actually means. Solana is valued at one-seventh of the value of Ethereum. 
Okay. Is it too late? There you go. There's your answer. So just finally then, on um, a personal note, what's your goal with everything, you know, crypto-wise and work-wise? Um, just to change people's lives, to change, touch, touch the lives of everyone that comes into contact with me. My, my, I've just got this thing of like, if you spend every single day of your life thinking about how you can change other people's lives, somehow it has to come back to you. And I can say that I'm trying to change the life of every single person that works with me, my producers, my, my team, my analysts, my, um, traders, just, you know, we get allocations. I give them all the allocations. Uh, no, I don't think anyone here has taken a salary. Like it's just one of those things where they make so much. We just give everything away that they don't actually need their salaries. Um, then I want to change the banter community's life. And then just mm -hmm. in general, like I've got the means to change people's lives. I don't want anything in return. I don't need, yeah, more money would be great, but it's not about more money. Um, so just change as many lives as possible and then watch other people who some were down and out and some who weren't having a great time and just watch them smile again and watch them like the, the fan mail that we get, you changed my life. You put me out of debt. I managed to pay my, my kids studying. I mean, you, you, you know, no fast car, no yacht would give me the same amount of pleasure as just changing other people's lives. And so hell just change other people's lives and don't ask for anything in return or don't expect anything in return. And it, yeah, that's the aim. The aim is just to, ch to touch and change as many lives as possible and do it for free. Yeah, and I think you'll do it with this crypto school. I mean, you're doing it now anyway with crypto banter, but with the school, with, you know, 1 million, do you say 1 million students or users? Is that what you said by the end of the year? By end of next year, yeah. By end of next oh, year. end of next year. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, we'll have to, I mean, I know we chat anyway, but we'll have to catch up as well when that's, when that's you know, going. And because I, I think that's amazing. Catch up. I'm getting you to do a 10 minute show on banter and you're going to start <laughs> pretty soon. And it's going to be like, it's called Microdose and Leia's going to do a few and she's going to fall so in love with the banter community. <laughs> and then she's going to want to do it every day. And eventually Leia's going to do a daily show on banter, 10 minutes and just give us the Microdose. I know it's going to happen. I can feel it. There you go. Oh, I have one last, one last question. Um, I saw on your show today, you were talking about wife changing money. What number is that? Um, oh, it's not a number. It's a, it's, you, you need a lot of money. If you if, wife changing money is a, is a big number. I mean, you know how expensive wives can be, right? Well, I'm not a wife, but I can imagine when I am one, I will be a pricey one. So, yes. Yeah, just, for, I mean, just for the record, I don't want to change my wife. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm happily married. I, I don't want to change my wife, but uh, it's a great term that, we've, that we use a lot. I like it. I think it's brilliant. When I heard it, I was like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's brilliant. You won't believe how many people send us mail and say, you know, it's a derogatory mail. How can you keep saying wife changing money? Why don't you use the term husband changing money? Oh, we also. No. We also on the Life's show. changing is better. We also on the show. We did like we broke up the tokens into categories. We said, "Are oh, they a one night stand?" Uh, it's like you know, slap me around and then let me go in the morning. Um, like we said, like don't leave a toothbrush, which means that you got to get in and you got to get out the same day. Like you can't mm. leave a toothbrush. Uh, uh, and then we said like date me, uh, uh, commitment, and then like marry me coins and like Bitcoin. Mm. And, and you won't believe how many emails we got, like saying, you know, it's derogatory to women. I was like, why? You think you think women don't also talk about one night stands, and you think women also don't talk about slap me around, and and you know, like, it's there are sensitive people in the world. Good luck. No, I'm totally with you. I mean, we could do a whole show talking about you know freedom of speech and derogatory words, because like, who cares? Honestly, I think it's great. I think it's fun. I think wife changing money is hilarious. I thought it was brilliant. Um, and if anyone has a problem with it, then they, that, oh my God, they got more problems they got to deal with. Cause that is literally if the most my wife insensitive. Have a problem with it, then everything is cool. There you go. Perfect. That's all that matters. Well, Ran, I want to thank you so much. Um, and I want to thank everybody for watching, um, and interacting. It's been really fun reading through all your comments. Um, and I'm really excited to potentially come on Crypto Banter then. Amazing. Leo. We look forward to having you and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love this. We should do it again. For sure. All right, guys. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.